to have a seat. Now, some time ago, I heard a, a German professor say that if Mark's gospel were submitted as a piece of work for marking, it would certainly fail. Mark mentions many points without developing them adequately. He brings in lots of different characters without introducing them properly. His structure is unclear, and worst of all, he has no conclusion. Well, just as well, isn't it, that Mark is not a piece of academic work. It was a book written about 2,000 years ago. It's not a, a modern biography. And in fact, if we want to think about Mark's gospel in modern terms, perhaps it would be best to think of it as more like a series of, of cartoons. Take the passage that we have just heard. In six verses, Mark talks about one of the major events of Jesus' life, his baptism. He talks about a highly significant time in, at the start of Jesus' ministry, the temptations. And he still has words to spare to summarize Jesus' message. All of that in 118 words. You can check that if you like. I, uh, I counted what Mark wrote in Greek, so that's the challenge. But I think Mark is like a good cartoonist. A good cartoonist uses just, just a few strokes for a very vivid picture. And like a good cartoon, he sets us thinking about many things that are implied rather than made explicit. Now, the first cartoon is Jesus being baptized in Jordan River by John. We call him John the Baptist. But Mark actually is not so interested in the baptism itself. He mentions it, of course. But he's more interested in the vision of the heavens opening, the spirit descending like a dove, and then the voice of the Father, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Do you notice something in that? Do you notice how, John, how Mark talks about the Spirit comes down and the Father speaks of the Son? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, right at Jesus' baptism, at the start of his ministry, we have the roots of what we now call Trinity. One God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. But thinking about Jesus' baptism, if John was baptizing people as a sign of their repentance, why was Jesus baptized? If we say he was sinless, if he was the perfect man, why did he? needs to be baptized if it was a sign of repentance? It's a fair question, isn't it? And, and any answer has to be along the lines that Jesus was identifying, identifying himself with sinful humanity, that he was voluntarily putting himself with us, who certainly are sinners, needing repentance. And in that sense... In that sense, Jesus' baptism was a foretaste 
of what he would do much more comprehensively at the cross, where he gave himself for us, where he died as the sinless one for us. So at his baptism, Jesus identified himself as one for us, so that we can identify with him and find in him forgiveness and a new life. We are, we are drawn, as it were, into the cartoon. So we can wonder, we can proclaim, this is my God. As we'll say, we believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We, we can stand on the banks of the Jordan, as it were, in our minds, with thousands, with millions others, worshipping this God shown to be Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, that takes up about a third of the words. And then our second cartoon moves with almost breathless speed, really. The Spirit immediately, as one of, John, one of Mark's favourite words, immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Now we have to turn to Matthew or Luke if we want any details at all about the temptations. Mark doesn't tell us what they were. But Mark does include a different little detail. He says, Jesus was with the wild beasts and the angels. A bit tricky, this one. Was it literal? Or are the wild beasts and the angels symbols of the internal struggle going on between Jesus and the evil one tempting him? We can read it either way. What we do have is Jesus about to launch into public ministry, <coughs> but first he has to be alone. Alone, that is, with the Father, and the devil, and the struggle within about his own identity, about his own work, about his future, about his calling. And we are mistaken if we think it wasn't a real struggle, because he was son of God, therefore he was protected from real temptation. No, the temptation was real enough. The New Testament teaches us that Jesus was tempted, tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. It was real for Jesus. It was real like in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus sweated blood and prayed that he would not have to go through with the cross. So Jesus knew temptation he knew testing when are you most tempted and tested i don't know about you but i find temptations and testing arising more from within when i'm alone and that can be much harder to deal with than coping with the fact that there are some nice biscuits in the cupboard. I can shut that. Or time on social media that I can switch off. I can't switch on what's go off what's going on on the inside. The most dangerous wild beasts are not out there, they're lurking, lurking within. And if we want to to grow as Christians, we'll probably find that the Holy Spirit pushes us to be alone with God. Perhaps for a few moments at the start of the day or the end of the day. And if that's the case for you, then you may well find it's a struggle as well as a joy. It amazes me, you know, when I'm reading or doing some work, or even watching sport on the telly. I can concentrate on that. 
But as soon as I turn to pray, my mind starts buzzing with all kinds of things. Unwanted thoughts and distractions and irrelevancies and a few nasty things welling up from inside. The fact is that if we want to follow Jesus, we can't avoid the wilderness. Do think about coming along to our Tuesday night groups during Lent because we'll be exploring the wilderness theme over the next few weeks. So, the baptism, exciting. The wilderness, tricky. The third cartoon, which is really a summary of Jesus' teaching, teaching ministry. As Mark puts it, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Jesus had an announcement to make. The Jewish people at that time were waiting. They were longing, they were praying for God to intervene. They wanted, they wanted God to help them throw out the Roman overlords, to restore them politically. But God had grander ideas. Do you know, rather than thinking about the kingdom of God as a place like we think of United Kingdom, a place with boundaries. It's better to think of God's kingdom as God's reign, God's rule, God's protection, if you like. Jesus was telling people that they could come under God's rule, his reign, his protection, his salvation, his healing. But to do that, they had to repent. That is, to turn away, to turn back, to change their life. Repent and believe, that's the positive, the good news. So Jesus is a summary. He traveled around. He delivered people from evil spirits. He healed people. He told people that God accepted them freely. He had a message of freedom, freedom from guilt, from pain, and everything that oppresses and, and holds down and holds back from being what God intends us, actually, to be. Believe, and you will see this. Trust Jesus. And know for yourself. No one else can do it for you. You have to enter God's kingdom, his rule, his reign for yourself. That's good news because you can. Reach out to God. You're welcome. Jesus has come close to us. Well, we ask ourselves, probably often enough, do we live in a world that's Needs that's crying out for good news. Conflicts, tensions, where folks seem unsure about a sense of direction. Moral values, the old certainties have been shaken. They're crumbling, but what's replacing them? Jesus addressed the issues of his day when people around wanted him to overthrow the Romans and restore Jerusalem. He didn't give people what they wanted. But he got people to look up and see what God is doing. Jesus was absolutely not the kind of populist leader who provided people with scapegoats. Blame these people, it's their fault. He didn't promise simple solutions. Jesus didn't offer unrealistic expectations. Jesus wouldn't make a modern politician any more than Mark 
would make an acceptable academic essay. That's my rant over, sort of. But actually, how do we address the real issues and questions of our society and our community without being bound by those questions? How do we bring in new angles? How do we bring in the God dimension, if you like? How can we talk about Jesus without becoming all churchy? How do we present Jesus in, as good news in language that our neighbours can relate to? The Jesus who gives freedom from guilt and a new purpose. Surely it's more than a message of saying, come to church and meet some nice people. Although if you do come to church, you do meet some very nice people. I hope this Lent, what we will do is risk meeting the real Jesus who turns us upside down and inside out. Well, it's nearly time for us to end. Do tell me if you think I'm reading too much into this passage, but I like to see in these three little cartoons a picture of what it means to be a growing Christian. From Jesus' baptism, I see a people who know Jesus and know that he's the one who died for us. A people who acknowledge Jesus along with the Father and the Son and the Spirit, one God. That's worship. There is a Redeemer, as we sang earlier. And then secondly, there's Jesus being driven into the wilderness, and we are with him, sharing, if you like, as Paul put it, in his suffering, knowing that we're alone before God, yet tempted still and undefiled, as we sang, tempted and tested and struggled, battles within. Here's the quiet time with God alone, which is not a cozy, nice time. It's about wrestling him and us. And then thirdly, there's Jesus out in the world proclaiming good news. Where we will go shortly, out there, where we will be all week. Worshipping with others, taking time to be alone with God and speaking freely and clearly in a language that people can relate to. Now that sounds to me like a church, like a Christian people who are going somewhere. So Lord, we pray that this Lent, as we think through these stories, think about you, Lord Jesus, in the wilderness. Think of you at your baptism. Think of you proclaiming good news to the people. We pray, Lord, that you would empower us by the same Spirit to be faithful, to be true to you, for your glory. Amen.